Welcome to our exciting interview with uh, Bruce Lipton, the eminent uh, scientist. Where? I think you said somewhere in, uh, in, the, in the States, the former uh, professor. Yes, a former professor. And uh, the reason why I'd like to interview Bruce is because he's written this uh, amazing book and it's made a big difference to my life and my family's life and we've written a lot about it on, uh, on the, the website. Bruce does a fantastic job of incorporating science into spirit and uh, that's what we're going to talk a little bit about uh, today. I believe you've just been up in Oslo. Absolutely wonderful. Almost as nice as Copenhagen. Almost as nice as Copenhagen. That's, that's what the Danes tell the Norwegians as well. <laughs> and if you think back 20 years ago when you were struggling to convince people about the, the ramifications of, of your research, how do you, how do you, could you have imagined that you're, you're sitting in Copenhagen and tomorrow you're going to be speaking to a totally old, old sold out uh, group of people? Well, I had no idea. Uh, you know, at one point I was thinking, well, I would just write this book and send it out to the world, and I would stay at home in my my little place up in the mountains. And uh, and then I realized that uh, I had to go out and start talking to people. And then the more people I started talking to, then the audiences got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the word started getting around. And it's also the most uh, important time of human evolution. Mm -hmm. So the new ideas I was talking about, the uh, people were ready, beginning to get ready to, uh, to think of something different because the old way of life has created a lot of problems yeah. for us. And your journey had started as a seven-year-old boy. Oh yeah, I, I, it was, uh, I remember very clearly, uh, I was in, uh, in school and uh, a science teacher brought in a microscope and uh, I never looked in a microscope and uh, first time I looked in the microscope, there was uh, a, an amoeba mm -hmm. and a thing called the paramecium. Uh, and as a little tiny kid, it was like, oh, there's something smaller than me in the world. <laughs> and that felt really good because uh, as a little kid, everything's bigger than you. And I realized, oh, it's a miniature world. And it was very exciting for me because the, um, looking at the little cells, even as a kid, I looked and I thought, they're not moving around, just floating around. They're, they're, they, they would move over here and look at something, mm -hmm. and then they'd back up and then move over here and look at something. And I started to look at that. And in my mind, I saw they're like little people. And that was a vision I held when I was seven years old and looking through a microscope. And when I graduated from college, uh, I went into um, graduate school mm -hmm. where I started using the electron microscope. Mm -hmm. And so my view of the cell went deeper and deeper and deeper inside the cell. Uh, it was so exciting because I was looking at things back then that people in the world had never seen. So for me, every day going to work was a day of discovery. It's like mm. pioneer stuff. Uh, and when I started to uh, uh, go deeper into the cell, I realized that my understanding as a seven-year-old was absolutely correct that cells are in fact miniature people. Mm. Cells have, all, I guess, all the functions that we have in our human body, uh, nervous system, digestive system, respiratory system, all, all the systems even, in, uh, which is surprising, an immune system. Uh, why this becomes relevant is when you understand that a human is made out of 50 trillion cells, that a human, all the characters that we express, all the behaviors we express come from cells, then it says, well, if you start to look at just a single cell, you may get more information about how humans work than trying to look at a community of 50 trillion cells. And this turns out to be absolutely true because when you go down to the bottom level and look at how a cell works, then you understand the basic fundamental nature of how humans work. Mm. And when you were, you were studying stem cells then and your uh, mentor at the time, he said, Bruce, you always have to look at the environment if the cells are not doing well. When did you fully understand what he meant about that? It, it was probably almost 15 or 20 years after I, taught, uh, I was taught this. And uh, it was very interesting because uh, my mentor, Erwin Koningsberg, mm. was one of the first people in the world to clone stem cells. And so I, when I was cloning these stem cells, which was in 1967, 40 some years ago, uh, I again was looking at things that no ordinary people had looked at because it was the first opportunity to see these stem cells in action. He was teaching me, I remember the first day he was teaching me how to do the culture technique. And I just get finished, I have the cells in the Petri dish, and I'm just ready to put them into the incubator. And then he says, when you come in tomorrow, uh, if the cells don't look right, 
don't blame the cells first. First look at the culture medium, which mm. is the environment. Mm. So basically he was saying the environment was, was controlling that, but even we weren't thinking of it that way. We were just saying, oh, we're making, we're trying to create the best culture medium. So if you have a poor culture medium, the cells don't do very well, and as you improve the culture medium, it gets better. So we were thinking we were just looking at the effect of the culture medium. But it came full circle about 15, 20 years later when my research on the stem cells revealed, in fact, it was the environment that controlled the genetics. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it was a real surprise because I realized, my God, the first day I did a cell culture, that was a suggestion. But at those days, we were so preoccupied with genes controlling life that uh, we never even gave consideration to the environment. Mm. So when I started to find that the environment was controlling the genes, it was a radical upheaval, a change in belief that was so different from everything that I was taught and everything that I was teaching medical students. Yeah, and that gave birth to epigenetics. And for people that don't know what epigenetics is, can you explain what that means and what the implications are for us? Well, first of all, the implications of epigenetics, I can clearly say this, the implication of epigenetics, it will change civilization. And that's not a, a, a you know, I'm not overblowing it. That is an exact fact, and I'll tell you why. What I was teaching before epigenetics was called genetics. Mm -hmm. And so what we were teaching was something called genetic control of life. Well, genetic control means simply control by genes, okay? And I say, well, good, this is what we teach people. And I said, but what is, it, what is the meaning of what we teach? And I say, well, if I tell you your genes control your life, then you look at your life in a different way because you say, well, I didn't pick these genes. And, I, and if I don't like my traits, I can't change the genes, so uh, I'm a victim of my heredity. That whatever is passing through my family is controlled by the genes, and I'm going to get those genes, and I'm going to have the same problems. So when people believe they're a victim, it takes away their power because they believe there are forces controlling them that they have no control over, so uh, they become irresponsible. So epigenetics is giving the power back to the people? Ah, well, yeah, because epigenetics, when I say epigenetic control, that little beginning, epi, E-P-I, means above. Mm. So I say epigenetic control, then what I'm saying is control above the genes. And all of a sudden, it's like, well, then the genes aren't controlling me. I go, no, the genes aren't controlling me. I say, what is? My response to the world, my belief, my perceptions of the world, uh, are turned into chemistry that then control my genes. And I said, well, so what's, what's different? Well, first of all, because I can change my perceptions, because I can change my beliefs, I can change my chemistry. And if I can change my chemistry, I can change my genes. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my goodness, after teaching people for 20 years they were victims, I turn around and say, oh my goodness, well, you're free to change your beliefs and your perceptions, which means you're free to change your genetics, which means you're not a victim. You're, in fact, a master of your biology because uh, as you change your belief or the way you respond to life, you change the genetic activity in your body so you control your genes. You're not controlled by your genes. And it's primarily our thoughts that control the expression uh, of our genes. Primarily, yes, and then of course we have to be very careful because we have a conscious mind with our conscious thoughts yeah. and we have a subconscious mind with completely different beliefs in it. Yeah, and 5% and conscious mind, 95% subconscious, right. determining so what's going on. 5% conscious mind means that 5% of the day you are controlling your life with your wishes and your desires. 95% of the day you're being controlled by the habits that you learned, especially uh, even before you were born, you were beginning to learn the habits uh, in the womb. Mm. And especially the first six years of your life, this is where the basic programming of the subconscious occurs uh, as a child for the first six years. So what you learn and experience as a child uh, doesn't go into your conscious mind. It actually goes straight down into your subconscious mind. So as you grow up, you repeat the habits and the behaviors that you learned in the first six years. Well, the fundamental problem with that is the conscious mind is you with your wishes and your desires. But the subconscious mind was programmed by your family and your community. So when I recognize that, then the first thing I say is, 
my goodness, I'm only controlling my life 5%.